is a man whose love for the Lord and love for his word is evident in what he says as well as what he does. And I could give no finer introduction to my friend Peter Williams. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you, uh, Mark, for your uh, kind words, certainly not underselling uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. He's uh, sitting there on the floor. There is some room at the back there as well. Uh, <laughs> what I want us to look at tonight is uh, things that could be better known about the resurrection. I guess you could um, say that most things should be better known about the resurrection. Uh, so we're going to fire straight in. It's going to be a fairly simple uh, argument. I have to say uh, it's been an immense privilege for me and my family to be here in Texas uh, uh, this week. My children had never been to America, yet alone, let alone Texas. So they uh, really have uh, seen the best. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Let's uh, look at... Uh, yeah, that's right, you get it. <laughs> the basic outline we're going to have is we're going to begin by looking at some non-Christian accounts. And by the end of this, you're going to wonder what on earth it's got to do with the resurrection. But I want us to look at some of the accounts by non-Christians of how Christianity began. Then we're going to look at some Christian accounts specifically of the resurrection, the empty tomb, and of the resurrection appearances. Now, anyone who says Jesus was actually raised from the dead often finds an objection that miracles simply don't happen. So we're going to look at objections to miracles before, mysteriously and cryptically, we look at what I call the third leg of the stool, uh, which is a further element in the argument for the resurrection. So let's begin with what non-Christians said about how Christianity began. And I want to consider three uh, in particular. I want to begin with Cornelius Tacitus. Tacitus was born around the year 56. Uh, not quite sure, but something like that. And he was a historian. He also was a politician. And he's someone that people rely on for history for maybe 40 years before he was born. Uh, and often writing about things that happened in very different places. But here, in this passage we're going to read, he writes about what happened in his hometown of Rome when he was a young boy, around aged eight. You might say, well, I don't trust every eight-year-old. But... Nevertheless, by the standards of, that people use for ancient historians, he's pretty close to the event. And here, he talks about a great fire that took place in Rome in the year 64. And it was thought that the emperor, Nero, a rather mad guy, had started the fire. Starting a fire uh, on your capital city tends to make you less popular. And so Nero was worried about his popularity, and therefore he found another group to blame. And this is where we take it up the story. But neither helped by humans, nor generous gifts from the emperor, nor all the ways of placating heaven could stifle the scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order. That means order of Nero. Therefore, to scotch the rumor, Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices whom the crowd called Christians. We're just going to pause there. The crowd called Christians. The word Christian occurs in the New Testament how many times? Does anyone know how many times it occurs? Not twice. Thrice. That's right. Three times it occurs. And all three times it is used by outsiders to describe Christians. Twice in the book of Acts, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, called that by others. Then we have Agrippa uh, saying, you almost persuade me to be a Christian to Paul. And then we have in 1 Peter chapter 3, if anyone suffers for that name, let them not be ashamed. So each time it's outside a language. Now that's an interesting thing because sometimes a term like that begins first with outsiders calling insiders it and then the insiders adopt it to call themselves, you see? So for instance, Quakers were first called Quakers by non-Quakers. It was an insult then the Quakers adopt it for themselves. Methodists were first called Methodists as an insult by outsiders. Then they adopt the term for themselves. And it's exactly the same with Christians. But notice here what we have in Tacitus. That it is the crowd that calls people Christians. 
that agrees exactly with what we have in the New Testament, showing us, by the way, that the New Testament documents come from the earliest stage before Christians had started calling themselves Christians. You see. So the crowd called them Christians. What can we tell from that name Christian? Well, Christian comes from uh, people who follow Christ, or Christus, as the Latin word is. Now, that word itself is a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. So if anyone's called Christian, we know that they must be someone who thinks that the Jewish Messiah has come. So already from this very word, we can tell a certain amount about Christian belief. Well, Tacitus goes on. And he says, Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius. Tiberius was emperor from the year 14 through to the year 37. So we get a chronological range for when Christ was put to death. It happened by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. Remember him from the New Testament. Well, he, according to external sources, was governor of Judea from the year 26 to 36. So again, we can know within a certain chronological range when Jesus was put to death using not the New Testament, but external sources. And he continues, and the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital, that's Rome itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and become fashionable. (laughs) You wouldn't say that about your own city, but he said it about his. Well, what we notice here, of course, he's not at all favorable towards Christians, but he confirms some key things, including that Christianity began in Judea, which is exactly, of course, what the New Testament tells us. Then we consider how he continues. First, then, the confessed members of the sect were arrested. Next, on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted, not so much on account of arson as for hatred of the human race. And derision accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs, or they were fastened on crosses, and when daylight failed, were burned to serve as lamps by night. So you can see a little bit from this. We can see a certain amount that agrees with the New Testament, and we can also see that it was very difficult to be a Christian. Notice that thing in that last slide, that he talks about vast numbers being arrested. Just the Christians that were known about by Nero constituted vast numbers, and this is within 30 or 35 years of the beginnings of Christianity. Christianity has spread all the way from Judea to Rome in that short time, and there are many, many Christians. Now, what has that got to do with the resurrection? Precisely this. Knowing how far and how fast Christianity spread is part of the background knowledge that we need to use when we come to judge whether it would have been possible for the story of the resurrection to have been made up later. And my view is this, that the further Christianity had spread, the more people had become Christians, the more you require a belief like the resurrection right up front to explain how it became so popular. What's more, it's very hard to explain a belief like the resurrection coming in at a later stage, 20 or 30 or 40 years after Christianity had begun spreading, when so many people have become Christians. It becomes very impractical to change a publicity campaign halfway through, so to speak. It doesn't work. So I would suggest this sort of information is absolutely key to understanding uh, the evidence for the resurrection. Let's go on to a second writer. This person, Pliny, was a politician and became governor of Bithynia, that's northwest Turkey in today's terms, around the year 112. He writes to the emperor talking about uh, Christians and how he was dealing with Christians at the time and, of course, asking the all-wise emperor to give him advice as to what he should do. So he talks about what he was already doing. I interrogated these people as to whether they were Christians. If they confessed, I interrogated them a second and a third time, threatening punishment. If they persisted, I ordered them to be led off. That means led off to execution. As for those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians, when they invoked the gods in words given by me and prayed with, wine, uh, with incense and wine offerings to your statue, which I had ordered to be brought for this very purpose, along with the images of the gods, and also cursed Christ, 
which is said that no true Christian can ever be compelled to do, I thought they should be discharged. Well, you can see he's a pretty nice guy. Uh, <clears throat> his argument is this. Don't kill everyone who's ever been called a Christian. Only kill those who persist stubbornly to call themselves Christians once you threaten them. And there are some other tests that you apply to check that people aren't Christians. Three in particular. They have to worship other gods, worship the emperor or Roman gods. The logic of that is, of course, that Christians are not willing to worship other gods. Also, they need to make sacrifices to these other gods. And then finally, they need to curse Christ. And I love this phrase which he adds, which is said that no true Christian can ever be compelled to do. Because, of course, here we have the governor of northwest Turkey writing to the emperor within about 80 years of the beginnings of Christianity, making the distinction between a true Christian and a Christian in name only. Isn't that fascinating? Within 100 years of it starting, of course, there are today, and there were back then, people who are Christians in name. And here we see that he's making the distinction, of course, having learnt that from uh, Christians themselves. This is a slightly later stage from what we saw in Tastus, where it's outsiders who call people Christians. Now, uh, Christians at this stage, by the year 112, are willing to call themselves um, uh, Christians. And also, uh, there are some people who are wanting to call themselves Christians, even though they're not true Christians. But the logic of what he's doing is that Christians only worship one God. Now that's an interesting thing, because we know that Christianity began as a messianic movement. That's the whole idea. Christ equals Messiah. We know it began in Judea. We know from the New Testament, but we also know from other sources that Christianity began as a Jewish movement. Now let's just think about this. How many gods do Jews believe in? One. That's right. God, Jews only believe in one God. That's pretty important because the logic behind this is you only worship that one being. That's going to be important when we see uh, how the passage continues. He talks about a document which named people as Christians, denounced them as Christians, and said this. Others named in the document said that they were Christians, but later denied it, saying that they had been, but they'd ceased three years ago or many years ago or even as much as 20 and so he then continues with what people who had ceased to be Christians described as going on in a Christian meeting. Three years or even 20 years before. Well, let's think about that. If he's writing in the year 112, 20 years before gives us approximately the year 92. So here what follows is a description of a first century Christian meeting according to people who have renounced the Christian faith. Let's read about it. They said that this had been the full extent of their guilt or error. They'd been accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn. Great time to have a church meeting. Well, I guess if you've got slaves in your congregation, you better begin before they start work. And to sing antiphonally, that's one group to another, a song to Christ as to a God. And to bind themselves by an oath, not to some crime, but rather not to commit theft, robbery, or adultery, not to break their trust, and not to refuse to return a pledge when asked to do so. So a great emphasis on honesty we have in this meeting as well. But notice that they are singing to Christ as to a God. Now this document is in Latin, and there is no Latin word a, so it could be as to a God or as to God. We don't really know, but what we do know this is that Jews only worship one God. The logic of the first bit of the quotation is that they would only worship, the Christians would only worship one being. They won't just worship the emperor. So if they're worshipping Christ, surely the logic of it is this, that they have identified Christ as that one God. Now some people have a view of how worshipping Christ arose, that it arose over a long period of time. Some sort of telephone game version. Now, I talked about the telephone game last year for any of you who are there who have seen that video. But the, the basic idea is this, that gradually over time, people had more and more exalted views of Christ. Uh, and so at first, they thought he was a very special person, then a very, very special person, then a very, very, very special person, then a very, 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 very special person, and then halfway to God, and then eventually three-quarters of the way to God, and finally, God himself after hundreds of years. <clears throat> 
There is a mathematical problem with this, ladies and gentlemen. The mathematical problem is this. Jews cannot ever have one and a half gods. It's not allowed. The total number of Jewish gods always has to add up to one. Okay? That contrasts with Greeks. It contrasts with Romans. How many gods can Greeks and Romans have? Lots. It's not a bound set. If a Greek god looks down from the sky, sees a pretty woman, gets together with her, they produce offspring, then you've got another half god. You see, you just keep on going. But the logic of this passage is that the Christians would only worship one being, and look, they're worshipping Christ. So that's a striking thing um, uh, that we can say in the context of getting to an argument about the resurrection. Then Pliny continues. Many people of every age, every rank, and of both sexes are being and will be called to trial. Nor is it only the cities that are affected, but the disease of this superstition is also reaching villages and ranches farmsteads. It seems possible to check and correct this. It's pretty well agreed that the temples, which had almost become deserted, have now begun to be frequented again. And that all the sacred rites which had been neglected for a long time are recommencing, and the flesh for sacrificial rites is being sold, for which, up to now, it was hard to find a purchaser. Now think about this. Governor of northwest Turkey, writing to the emperor within about 80 years of the beginnings of Christianity, saying so many people in his area had become Christians that the temples are almost deserted and no one's buying sacrificial meat. It's quite striking, isn't it? How many people became Christians? We also know it agrees with Tastus how hard it was to be a Christian. We also know, by the way, it agrees with the New Testament, which tells you how hard it was to be a Christian. How many people became Christians? Look at the book of Acts. And then we're struck. Go to Acts chapter 19, and you will there read about the great riot there was in Turkey, in Ephesus, when so many people became Christians that the silver workers who made the idols that people worshipped were worried about their trade, the simple economic effects of people becoming Christians. Well, it's very similar to what we read here. Many, many people becoming Christians. <clears throat> well, I've given you two accounts by um, uh, uh, Roman authors, and we can see just how far Christianity spread. I want us to come on to a uh, Jewish writer, and that is Josephus. He was writing about what happened in his hometown of Jerusalem when he's around age 25. So he, again, it's amazingly close to the events for any ancient record that we have. But he describes what happened in the year 62 when there's a power vacuum and the high priest sees power and he says this. He assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before it the brother of Jesus who is called Christ, whose name was James and some others. And when he had made an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he handed them over to be stoned. Well, that's quite striking, isn't it really? Uh, because what we have here is a record of how James recorded in the New Testament as a leader of the early church, was killed. The New Testament agrees with Josephus that Jesus had a brother called James, Mark chapter 6, verse 3. So what we find is an agreement here. But think about this. He is dying for belief in his brother. So there are people a long way away in Rome and in Bithynia who are dying for their belief. We also have people very close to the events. How many of you could persuade your brother or sister that you're the son of God? It's quite tough, isn't it? I mean, particularly when they've seen your bedroom. But <laughs> so basically, the Christian and the non-Christian evidence agrees. There are people close at hand, there are people far away, but there is a very high cost to being a Christian. That I want as background information when we come on to the Christian accounts. Now, someone might say, I'm not interested in Christian accounts. How can I trust them? They're biased. Well, firstly, bias does not mean that something should not be considered. After all, if someone accused you falsely of something, you have a vested interest in defending yourself. And someone might say, well, you've got a vested interest. We're going to discount your testimony. That's not very fair, is it? So bias isn't a reason to discount something. And of course, most things about most subjects are written by people who are really into the subject. So people who write about computer games tend to be geeks. People who write about 
um, certain sports tend to be into those sports. So, of course, we expect most of the documents about early Christianity to be by Christians. That's not surprising. But what we can say is there are many Christian accounts which give us evidence of the resurrection. In fact, 27, just if we include the New Testament. Not all of them talk about the resurrection, but every single book in the New Testament presupposes that Jesus is alive in some way, and some of them go into much more detail. There are books that we could look at outside the Gospels which give us evidence. Consider, for instance, 1 Corinthians, written roughly around the year 55. There, Paul writes to the church and says that he had received the resurrection as a teaching when he was first converted, and that he had passed it on to the Corinthians when they had first been evangelized, and that he had reported to them how many people had seen Jesus risen from the dead, and how, included amongst that, were 500 people who had seen Jesus at one period, most of them still alive. Now, it could be, of course, a very clever bluff. Paul writes to a church uh, suggesting there are many people who've seen Jesus risen from the dead, and yet they can't actually go and meet any of them. But it wouldn't really work, would it? Because Paul has co-workers. What would they think about this? It doesn't really work as a bluff. There have to be those sort of people, or else Paul starts losing credibility. And by the way, he does want credibility with the Corinthians. That's very clear. We could look at the letter of Galatians, written somewhat earlier. Uh, Galatians begins with an argument that says, I have received my message from God and I got it when I was converted. That has to be, when you add up the numbers in Galatians 1, sometime by the mid-30s at the latest. And yet here is how he begins the letter. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. The resurrection wasn't a peripheral uh, Christian belief. It was something that was really central and was there up front. So some people, when they make an argument for the resurrection, would in fact ignore the Gospels and go straight for Paul. And there's a good sort of argument you can do. I'm just not going to do that tonight. I want us to look at the Gospels. First thing about the Gospels is, of course, that there is some relationship between the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are more similar to each other than those three are to John. And you can divide up, and there are different ways of counting this depending on how you count. But broadly speaking, you can see there's a relationship between the Gospels. There are, there's an overlap between things that you've got in Matthew and in Luke, an overlap between things you've got in Matthew and in Mark, between Mark and Luke, and so on. There are also things that each of them have that others don't have. What that means is people can look at the material critically and analyze it. But it also means that we're able to see that there are different sources of material in there. We cannot explain the Gospels by saying that two of the Gospels have simply copied from another one with no further material. But when people look at the resurrection accounts in the Gospels, they might might say, well, aren't there a number of problems when you read them? When I read the resurrection accounts, they seem to me to differ in lots of ways. For instance, did the women when they went to the tomb, see one angel or two? And was it that, did that happen on their first visit to the tomb? Did Peter and John go to the tomb before or after women saw the angel or angels? What exactly did the angel say to the women? And does Mary first learn of the resurrection from Jesus or from the angels? You can see that these are substantial differences. But what do those differences show us? Well, I think they show us very simply, that the four Gospels were not copied from each other in this regard. As one New Testament scholar says, the later we imagine these Gospels being written down, the resurrection accounts being written down, or written up, as he says, let alone edited, the more likely it would be that inconsistencies would be ironed out. So here we've got, if you like, in the four Gospels, some raw um, descriptions. They're they're not... um, polished in the sense of someone's come through and edited them to make sure that they all say exactly the same thing. And that is a reason why I think we can treat them as independent. At the same time, these four accounts of the resurrection give us uh, things that give, uh, show us their trustworthiness. For instance, let's start with the question of wording. Now, I made an argument last year in my lecture, but some of you uh, will have forgotten that even if you saw it, that there is 
Uh, There are signs of authenticity in the New Testament for the very words that are spoken sometimes. Here, I'm going to show you a little bit more about that. There's a striking thing when we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that when uh, they have people speaking, there's a higher level of agreement between those three Gospels than when we're just talking about their narrative. They're not describing people thinking. Now, there are various ways that people try and describe that and account for that. One of them is by saying that there was a common source behind Matthew and Luke. But whatever we can say, we can say that there were, um, there's a pattern when we look at wording that when we have quotations, there's a much greater fidelity, closeness to uh, each other. Um, not that they're unfaithful in other contexts, but simply that they have much more freedom uh, to describe things. So you could take, for instance, the passage of that man who's healed. Remember in uh, Mark and Luke, he's lowered down through the roof. Uh, Matthew doesn't tell us about that, although um, uh, no one wants to read Matthew for the Sunday school version because it's really important to have him lowered down through the roof. Uh, And then uh, we have the wording generally fairly different, verses 1 to 7 of of, of Mark chapter 2. Then we get to Mark chapter 2 and it's wording of Jesus, and suddenly Mark and Matthew and Luke are much closer. And then we have a bit that isn't wording of Jesus, and they're a bit further apart. That is the sort of pattern you find throughout the Gospels and also is occurring with the resurrection accounts. So what we can say is when we look at the resurrection accounts as a whole and we compare passages dealing with like subjects, the amazing thing is that they're pretty different. Look at um, the number of words that these different passages each have, the number of words that they have in common, and it's pretty few. You see, not many words in common, right? Agreed? Now, Let's look at some examples of speech. We then come to an angel speaking, and we're going to compare just Matthew and Mark. Now, the bit in the first line, but the angel answered and said to the women, that's not speech, is it? It's just before you get to speech, or as Mark says, and he said to them, not much in common. But when we get onto the exact wording, we see it's quite close. Do not be afraid in one, do not be alarmed in another. For I know that, reported in one, omitted in the other. You seek Jesus who was crucified, you seek Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. Well, the only way those two accounts differ is by omission of some details. That's all uh, the, 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 the difference there is. Then we have, he's not here for he has risen, as against he has risen, he's not here. Well, that's not very different, it's just a difference of order. And by the way, it's exactly the sort of difference of order that occurs when we report the sort of conversations we've had. And we, we remember things, we don't necessarily remember the exact order in which the sentence, um, uh, sentences occurred, nor does it matter, nor is it untrue when you report things uh, simply uh, listing uh, the sentences. As he said, omitted, then come see the place where he lay or where they laid him. Very, very similar when it comes to the wording, and yet the surrounding narratives are really very different. Let's go on to comparing Matthew and Luke. The same passage in Matthew, I'm wanting to put it against Luke this time. They said to them, as against, but the angel answered and said to the women. Now here we can see Luke's quite a bit more different than Matthew and Mark. Uh, In Matthew, do not be afraid, Uh, In Luke, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Uh, Matthew has, for I know you seek Jesus who is crucified. Luke has no equivalent. But then we have, he's not here, but he has risen. Now notice that, that Matthew and Luke have exactly the same order. Now this is one of those things that you can't explain very easily by saying that Matthew and Luke um, copied from a common source um, and also copied from Mark, which is what some people uh, want to to do because in that theory they generally like to follow Mark first. But anyway, that's what uh, is sometimes called the uh, argument from minor agreements. It's a bit technical and we don't need to go very far. As he said in Matthew, not in Luke, come see the place where he lay and Luke has a long uh, bit, remember how he told you. Now you can see that Luke there is really pretty different but in the midst of all reporting different speech he has a sentence or two sentences, short sentences, which are basically identical. Do you see? Now, how would you explain that? 
if Luke is, has got Matthew in front of him and is copying from it, how would you get that sort of pattern of difference and then precise agreement? I think that sort of difference but precise agreement pattern comes best, is best explained if we say, obviously there was a larger amount of speech and each of the writers has selected from that things which seemed uh, appropriate. We then can compare Matthew and John. Now, I'm not looking just at speech here. I'm also looking at what we might call subtle agreements or undesigned coincidences, as one author put. You see, <clears throat> Matthew has Jesus meeting the women. And then he records that they held onto his feet. John has an almost completely different account in which Jesus just meets Mary. But funnily enough, in that account, one of the first things Jesus says is, do not cling on to me. It doesn't say um, she clung on to him, and then he said, do not cling on to me. Just simply, it reports the speech, presupposing, by the way, that she'd already done it. So you see that the narratives subtly agree. Agree in such a subtle way, you can't say people put those details in to make the accounts look similar so that they would agree and be trusted. Because in other ways, the accounts are so different. Then we have uh, Jesus making two rather different speeches. One of them, he says to the women in Matthew, do not be afraid, but go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they'll see me. But in John, he says, do not cling on to me, for I have not yet ascended to, my, to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. It's all pretty different except for the phrase, my brothers, which is a very striking thing because it's something Jesus doesn't go around talking about very much. Of course, there's that occasion when his physical family come and they stand outside and, they, and you know, it's said, your family are outside and he turns and looks at the people around him and says, those who do the will of my father, they're my brother, sister and mother. But here we have, with no talk about brothers in the context before and so on, suddenly that phrase. Now to me, that makes best sense if we have independent eyewitnesses describing, praising, summarizing part of a larger conversation. And suddenly these clues are put in which show you the level of agreement there is between one and the other. And by the way, what's going on in John's gospel where he talks about my father, your father, well, if you have a common father, you're brothers. So there is actually a theme in that John section which really underli underlines uh, one of those uh, phrases in Matthew. So it's pretty difficult to say that this was all invented. Well, <clears throat> there are also other signs, things that you'd be pretty unlikely to invent. What in particular? Well, the first thing you'd be unlikely to invent about a resurrection is... A resurrection. I mean, a resurrection is a very odd thing. This is how N.T. Wright describes it. Christianity was born into a world where its central claim was known, and we can put that in inverted commas if you like, known to be false. Many believed that the dead were non-existent. Outside Judaism, nobody believed in a resurrection. So it was a problem. Resurrection, I mean, there are two really bizarre Christian beliefs. One is that you should worship someone who's been crucified, i.e. publicly shown by the Romans to be a loser, because that's their way of showing that they're in charge, and that person's thoroughly discredited. And secondly, that you should follow someone who's been resurrected. Well, if you've been really uh, um, affected by platonic thought in any way, you think that the body is a substandard thing, and really, you, after life, you get out of the body into some spiritual realm or realm of the mind. But to come back physically, well, it's a rather disgusting. You see, that's the problem with the resurrection. So that would be a very odd thing to invent. But then we could look on. Why would you have the women as witnesses? I disagree with Josephus in this quotation, but I'll read to you what he says. Let not the witness of women be accepted because of the lightheadedness and insolence of their kind. Well, as I say, I completely disagree with him, couldn't disagree more. But you see that it's not the sort of thing that you would have invented. And yet all four resurrection accounts have women first at the tomb, the women, the prime witnesses. <clears throat> 
Then we have the odd thing pointed out by N.T. Wright that in all four Gospels we have bright angels but are not very dazzling Jesus. You see, we can go through Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and we can see that the angels, when they're described, whether they're men or angels, because, you know, angels just look like men except they're white, uh, uh, their raiment is white as snow, white robe, dazzling clothes, in white, and yet no dazzling Jesus. You see, if I'd been inventing a resurrection, I would have made sure Jesus really sparkled, really stood out, really dazzled, because he's the main guy. And yet, this is what we have. So it's not that they're seeing some sort of ghost-like figure, um, someone uh, in, in, they're not in some state of hallucinating. It's really striking that we have, amid all of the differences between the accounts that you can see, some really common elements. Because it's the pattern of difference and commonality which is so striking to me, and which to me is a sign of authenticity. Another common element across the accounts is talk about doubt. Now you think how Matthew leads his gospel up to the great climax. It ends in Matthew 28 verse 20 with the disciples being sent out into all of the world and Jesus saying he's with them to the end of the age as they reach out and baptize and evangelize and so on. It's a great climax to the gospel. So why, four verses before the end, does he say, and when they saw him, the risen Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Matthew, you spoiled it all. That was going to be a great climax. Why on earth did you have to bring doubt into it? And worst of all, doubt when people are actually seeing Jesus. That really undermines everything, doesn't it? But again, we find it's not just Matthew. We have the same in Luke. The women report to the men what they've seen and the men don't believe. Then Jesus appears to the uh, disciples in the room. And what does it say? As he appears to them, he says to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your hearts, even as they see him? And then it continues, while they still disbelieved for joy. And then, of course, you know what goes on in John's gospel. It's the story of doubting Thomas, isn't it? You see, we've got it there in Matthew, Luke, and John. Now there are debates about the ending of Mark, but in the longer ending of Mark, again you have the theme of unbelief. Wouldn't believe it, didn't believe them. Their unbelief. You see, across the Gospels we have the theme of unbelief. Why? Because if people saw Jesus risen from the dead, even if he's in front of them, the natural thing is not to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. The natural thing to believe is that God has sent a look-alike angel. Why? Because Jesus died. You saw him die, so it can't be Jesus. You see? And that's what people would have thought. Because they knew if they were good Jews, that the resurrection was something that happened to all people at the end of time, or maybe to God's people at the end of time, but not to one person out of sequence with the rest. So if that's happened... Clearly, God must have sent a lookalike angel to comfort us or give us some message or something. So how did they come, become convinced of the resurrection? And why did the authors put in the theme of doubt, which doesn't really seem to help their cause very much? People might say, well, couldn't it all be some great conspiracy? Well, let's think about conspiracies for a while. The conspiracies, of course, struggle to explain two sorts of evidence simultaneously. One is the empty tomb and the other the resurrection appearances. Any one of them they might explain, but not both together. You could explain how no one ever found the body, no one ever claimed to have found the body, by having some people steal a body for some reason. They're quite heavy things to do, but and why you would steal a body. Um, Maybe some disciples, a small group of disciples stole a body. That wouldn't explain why so many people said they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. It just doesn't do it. What's more, they don't have very long to plan that sort of hoax. If you're going to do a hoax of a resurrection, let me give you a bit of advice. You know, if you're going to, if you're a disciple, you need to plan a resurrection. The best thing is not to let Jesus get arrested in the first place. 
Because, you know, once someone's been arrested and then executed, it's far harder to produce that person alive again. So that means if you're planning a resurrection, you only have at the most three days to plan it all. What about sincere delusion? We know people who are bereaved sometimes see loved ones, don't they? Well, that doesn't explain the empty tomb, does it? What about group hallucination? Couldn't people have all seen something amazing? Well, let's imagine a group of people sitting around on hallucinogenic drugs, okay? Let's imagine them. And they're all on this trip. Do they all see the same thing? Hey, I see a pink elephant, man. You know, I, I, look, group hallucination does not exist. You know, if you would be really struck if someone said, I had a dream last night, and someone else said, oh, I had exactly the same dream, and another person said, oh, I had it all. Or if we all wrote down the dream we'd had without talking, and it was all the same. Has that ever happened to you? It's pretty weird, isn't it? So group hallucination has no power to explain this sort of thing. It doesn't explain the agreements in the accounts at all. The natural explanation, of course, if you did see anything, is that you were seeing an angel, not that you were seeing Jesus. What's more, think about the variety of resurrection appearances. It's so amazing. I think it's best explained by the fact that there were a number of women, a minimum of six women at the tomb if we add up the four accounts. Not all in a single group, and I don't think that all six women would have gone into the tomb simultaneously. That means they're at different angles, they see different things, they hear different conversations, and they then report back to different gospel writers what they saw. That, to me, explains the data that we have. But think about the resurrection appearances for a little while. What, what do we have? Well, we have Jesus appearing uh, in the morning and in the evening, in Judea, in Galilee, in the town, in the country, indoors and outdoors, by prior appointment, without prior appointment, to groups of one or two or up to 500, to groups of men, to groups of women. Uh, we have him appearing, sitting, standing, walking, sometimes far off when they're in the boat. Then they get near and he's close. He's cooking. He's you know, they eat with him, they have backwards and forward conversations. This sort of intensity can't be explained or paralleled with the sort of religious experiences people might talk about. You know, having seen a ghost somewhere in a dark, uh, creaky old house, or seeing some statue uh, moving very slightly when they stare at it, or gazing at the sun for long enough until they see some figure in it. It's not the same thing. The intensity here means that either you have a whole load of people who are lying or you have a whole load of people to whom something remarkable really did happen. That to me is a pretty strong evidence for the resurrection. And together I would say the combined effect of the empty tomb and the resurrection appearances is what we need to take note of. Now, someone might say, but miracles don't occur. Famously, the person who wrote about miracles and made the argument for against miracles was David Hume, the philosopher, who said basically the problem is they occur so infrequently or claim so infrequently that makes them less trustworthy. Our belief in something should be proportionate to how regular something occurs. Or, as he says, the evidence resulting from human testimony a bit of diminution gets less, greater or less, in proportion as the fact is more or less unusual. He says, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against the miracle, from the very nature of the fact, is as entire as any argument from an experience can possibly be imagined. Or, as it might be put in another occasion, no miracle has ever been attested by enough really sensible people with enough education for us to believe it. Humans are basically gullible. There are more miracles around when people are less educated or less civilized. And anyway, if one religion has some miracles, what about all the other religions? Don't their miracle claims count against the claims of the first one? Or as it might be put in more modern terms, isn't anything more probable than a miracle. I mean, any explanation would be better, wouldn't it? Or as Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Or, 
Some people might say science couldn't work if some of the natural laws uh, that we assume are violated. And besides, assuming natural laws is actually very beautiful and simple. You've got one system to explain everything. The moment you allow some sort of violation of that, uh, miracles upset the order of things. So there are a number of ways that people might attack miracles. Well, I just want to respond briefly to those. Firstly, of course, your prior or antecedent beliefs, the beliefs you have beforehand, really do make a huge difference to how probable you judge something or how extraordinary you judge something to be. If you don't believe there's a God, then of course a miracle is always going to seem almost infinitely improbable. However, if you believe in the God of the Hebrews and that he did great things, is it really improbable that in his people at a particular time something really remarkable would happen? I don't think it is so improbable. So again, your prior beliefs affect your judgment of what is probable or even extraordinary. So that slippery word that Carl Sagan said about extraordinary beliefs requiring extraordinary evidence is not really uh, so simple. What's more, sometimes you need to make a decision based on pretty limited evidence. Let's say you're in business, you're about to do some really great deal, uh, some takeover or some merger, whatever it is, some huge deal that's going to go on, and then you suddenly get a call on your cell phone. And it's from an unknown number, but it, the voice at the other end says, this is the police, I'm afraid a member of your family has been involved in a terrible accident, will you please come straight away? How much evidence do you have that that person is not having you on? Not very much. You could ask them some questions just to try and verify that what they say is true, but time is short, so you're probably not going to do it. So at that stage, based on pretty limited evidence, if you're a responsible person, you are going to drop whatever deal, whatever beautiful thing you are about to do, and go and see that family member, aren't you? Sometimes the urgency of a situation requires you to act on pretty limited evidence. Now I just say this because some people think that when they're dealing with questions of God, that they just have all the time in the world. And I want to say that's not true. People are often making decisions to commit themselves in a deep relationship to someone based on extremely limited evidence. Isn't that true? People, I mean, how much evidence do you have of how that person will behave in the future? I mean, some people don't even bother collecting much evidence on what they have done in the past, do they? So you think about that. And so how can we, if that's the way we're living our lives, suddenly say, well, when it comes to a relationship with God, I need some extraordinary level of proof. I think there's an inconsistency there, which we can call attention to. What's more, when Hume argues against miracles, he basically says, unless you coerce me to believe in a miracle, I am not going to believe. He says, what would make me believe in a miracle? Well, if, God, if there was some unexplained darkness over the whole earth for eight days, no one could explain it, then I'd believe. So if there was an unexplained darkness for seven days, you wouldn't? I mean, what exactly do you mean? Why do you set that um, standard there? Given the ba right background beliefs, of course, the evidence for the resurrection is really very strong. My argument is that if you don't believe in the resurrection, you're constantly going to have to be reading the evidence against the grain. What's more, miracles are not a disturbance of order, but in fact a sign of order, as I hope to come on to in my last point. The third leg of the stool, which is, very simply, everything else about Jesus. Okay, I wasn't going to give you anything profound tonight. Everything else about Jesus. That's my final argument. You see, we've got two lines of argument together. The empty tomb and the resurrection appearances. Okay? Those two things are quite striking. If they were said about anyone in the past with a, uh, the amount of evidence that we have in the New Testament, we should take that seriously. But I'd want to say they aren't just about any old person. They're actually about a person about whom we can establish a number of important things quite independently. You see, we can verify many things about Jesus using a normal historical method, and we can establish these things. 
Now, each one of these things, if I really want to be hyper-skeptical, I can debate. But what I'm having to do if I do that is each time read the evidence in a less than natural way. And so the pattern is that I'm trying to avoid uh, an obvious conclusion. What can we establish? Well, firstly, that Jesus was already famous before these events were recorded of him. I don't think that's a particularly controversial statement. He was already believed to be Messiah. Many uh, scholars, skeptical scholars, believe that he already thought that he was the Messiah and that other people already thought he was the Messiah. That seems the most obvious explanation for why he would have come in on a donkey uh, as um, uh, we celebrate on Palm Sunday. Now that's a striking thing. Because it means it's not just that you've got a resurrection uh, about a random person. You've got a resurrection about a person who already is seen by some and may see himself to be the climax of all of God's plans. Well, that's quite a striking thing. It's not just a random person, you see. What's more... He was already believed to have performed miracles. More miracles are reported about Jesus of Nazareth than about any person from that period. What's more, he was already at an early stage believed to have been descended from David and to have been born in Bethlehem. You might say, well, maybe those bits in the New Testament were made up uh, afterwards. Well, let's say maybe they were. But think about this. We already have in non-Christian sources, Jesus being worshipped uh, by the end of the first century. Within the Christian sources, it's even earlier. What's more, we can say that if you say the bit about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, recorded in Matthew and in Luke, was made up later, I want to know when. You see, it's pretty difficult to imagine it happening in the first 30 years of Christianity because guys like James, Jesus' brother, was around leading Christianity. I'm a younger brother, and I think I know where my older brothers were born. Why? Because we've been talking about it in our family for a, lo for a long time. So what would it be pretty hard to start changing a story as basic as where someone was born? I mean, has anyone here ever changed the story of where they were born during their lifetime? I mean, I've been telling people, when people ask, where was I born? I've been saying London all of my life. You know, I, I actually have never met anyone who's changed the story of where they were born. But may, maybe there are such people. But um, it's a pretty difficult thing to do. And, and yet, if you say, well, maybe the story about Jesus being born in Bethlehem was made up, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years after Christianity began, there are so many Christians around the place. Imagine them after they're, you know, getting strung up on crosses and burnt, as, you know, or whatever going to people who are in that sort of pressure and saying, hey, you know that person we've been telling you about and you've been you know, risking your life for? Um, you know those stories we said about him being born in Nazareth? Actually, the new story is it's Bethlehem because that fits better with a bit of the Old Testament. You know, it just doesn't really work. <clears throat> What's more, it's agreed historically that Jesus died at Passover, this time that we remember now, which is of course the time when the Jews remembered the greatest deliverance that God had ever made of them. So if you're going to choose a time to die, in, which is going to be the best possible time to sweep up all the symbolism of what God's done in the Old Testament, that's as good as you can get. And just by sheer coincidence, that's when Jesus died. What about his teaching? Another remarkable thing about Jesus is his teaching. We know the golden rule. I do not read Chinese, but I thought it was pretty, so I put this up. Confucius. Confucius uh, came up with a saying about 500 years before Jesus that what you do not want yourself, do not force unto others. That was a, what we might call a negative golden rule. A rabbi around the time of Jesus put it this way. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That's the whole law. How does Jesus put it? Jesus puts it like this. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now there we can see Jesus has the positive golden rule, and no one had come up with that before him. Okay? Now you might say, how do I know Jesus said that rather than one of his disciples put it on his lips? Well, let's say we don't know that. Either way, there's something remarkable about Jesus. Either he said that most remarkable ethic, which has often been regarded the highest ethic that's ever been put down in such a pithy way, 
or he just by sheer coincidence happened to have a brilliant disciple who made it up. I mean, either way, there's something remarkable attached to Jesus. I mean, maybe he had genius disciples who made up stories like the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son and so on. But that was very lucky of him, wasn't it? So you see lots and lots of coincidences about Jesus. You see, I want to show you another completely independent form of coincidence to end on. And you can see that this is thoroughly independent of all of the other coincidences I've told you about Jesus. (coughs) And it relates to the time of his death. We know from Tastus that Jesus died between the year 26 and 36. He died on a Friday, uh, as it's been uh, agreed uh, for a very long time, with a constant lot of celebrations of Good Friday amongst the Christians. To die at Passover time means he must must have died at the 14th or the 15th of Nisan, according to Passover time. This is not just that what you have in the four Gospels, it's also what you have in the record of Jewish traditions in the Talmud, which says on the eve of Passover they hung Jesus the Nazarene. So Jews and Christians agree on that. Well, in order for that to happen, when could it happen in years? Well, a friend of mine, Colin Humphreys, who's a professor in Cambridge of science, uh, getting together with an astronomer, has written about this subject, and it's come out in a Cambridge University press book called The Mystery, of the Last Supper. The basic thing is this, that there are two possible dates for when you can have a Friday on one of those two, um, uh, 14th or 15th Nissan, uh, in the right period. So we have between these two possible dates of Friday the 7th of April in AD 30 or Friday the 3rd of April in AD 33. The arguments for 33 over 30 are the date of the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, the length of Jesus' ministry, according in, to John's Gospel, and the behavior of Pilate, who, in his negotiation with the Jews, really seems very weak, and we know that he was significantly politically weakened um, in uh, the year 31. So it works better after that date rather than before. So I would conclude that the crucifixion took place on the 3rd of April, AD 33. Now, by sheer coincidence, a thing that simply has not been known until recent decades is this. When we look at the account of the um, uh, crucifixion in Mark, it talks about from the sixth hour till the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. We know that there was one possible historian from the time, Thallus, who records that, at least as quoted in a Christian writer. But Peter also mentions in the book of Acts, When he preaches at Pentecost, he says this, the sun shall be darkened, turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. He's quoting Joel. Now the striking thing is this. That date, 3rd of April, AD 33, was the date of a lunar eclipse that took place in Jerusalem, visible from 6.20 p.m. to 7.11 p.m. The times are really quite precise. That's been calculated independent of any date of the crucifixion. It's something that's worked back from astronomy. Now, during a lunar eclipse, of course, the sun, um, uh, well, the sun can't shine directly onto the moon because the earth is in the way. And that gives the moon a reddish view. Now, this is just, if you like, and it's not the icing on the cake, but it's just one more coincidence associated with Jesus of Nazareth. Something that's only recently, in recent decades, been calculated by scientists that as the crowds were waiting to eat their Passover meal, they would have seen this very peculiar thing go on. So when we look at the person of Jesus, what we see is not that the resurrection is some horrible thing that spoils the pattern of science. Not at all. What we find is, in fact, Jesus himself forms the pattern. Do you see? The empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, the teaching, the miracles, the claims of Messiah, even this eclipse. All sorts of things cluster together in a remarkable way upon Jesus. And it's at that point that you say, oh no, Jesus isn't spoiling the pattern by Believe, you know, if we believe that he's raised from the dead, rather, he is the pattern. He is the meaning of life. He is the ordering principle of knowledge. This is what John's gospel begins by telling us. In the beginning was the Word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word became flesh. The ordering principle of all things has come amongst us, and we, if we have at all scientific minds, we should be thinking, yes, that's the pattern, that's the ordering principle, and that's what I'd like to leave with you tonight. Thank you so much for listening. Is there anything I need to translate for you into Texan that he said? <laughs> Any interpretation necessary? All right. Well, let me just make a couple of quick comments. I know there are several of us that want to, uh, uh, to add some thoughts. Uh, in no way to disagree, of course, as you would expect. Uh, that would be very dangerous of me to disagree. Uh, the truth of the resurrection, John MacArthur wrote, gives life to every other area of the gospel. That's why this discussion is so critically important. And it's why it's so important even for us Christians who are spiritually convinced that we are aware of the evidence that supports the belief that we hold. Uh, reinforcing the reality of the resurrection. Uh, MacArthur goes on to say, The resurrection is the pivot on which all of Christianity turns, without which none of the other truths would much matter. Without the resurrection, Christianity would be so much wishful thinking, taking its place alongside all other human philosophy and religious speculation. So the evidence is important. Interesting, as Dr. Williams was talking, I was reminded of this sermon I'm going to be preaching tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. in the main worship center at Champion Forest Baptist Church. <laughs> be sure to arrive early to uh, get your uh, place there. If you don't have a church, we want you to come. That's a shameless plug, and I'm not embarrassed at all. If you don't have a church home, come and join us tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to mention uh, something I, I found interesting. It's uh, wonderful to study God's Word, uh, and, and God gives you something new as you go a little deeper into His Word. And this week as I've been studying, I noticed something. When Peter walked away from the tomb, wondering, which will be the point of my message tomorrow, I've been sort of getting inside of Peter's head, Mark, and imagine what was he wondering. One of the things he was wondering is, is did the bad guy steal Jesus' body? Now, there was doubt initially what's happened. Resurrection wasn't their first assumption. Their first thought was, the bad guys have come and stolen his body, adding insult to injury, as if crucifixion wasn't enough. Now they've stolen his body. But Peter looks into the tomb, and he sees the grave clothes laying there. Now put your CSI cap on for just a minute. Who steals a body in the dead of night? Not just because, as Peter mentioned, the weight of it and the awesome task of stealing a grown man's body, but who in the world unwraps that body piece by piece pound after pound of burial cloth, even though hastily prepared, was prepared for burial. Who unwraps a body, fingers, toes, piece and layer and layer, and leaves the clothes laying there and takes the naked, bloody, bruised body with them? Wouldn't that be the exact wrong thing to do? Wouldn't the bad guys have then reinforced the supposed rumor of the resurrection that in fact he had come to life and didn't need those grave clothes anymore? There is, however, a resurrection rumor, and you'll find it in Matthew chapter 28. Those who were guarding the tomb that night, who the disciples first assumed had stolen the body, went to the bad guys and said, something terrible has happened, and they relayed the story about what had happened. Uh, if you'll read the scripture, and I'll just refer it to you, uh, here's what the bad guys said. They cooked up this scheme, we'll call it the resurrection rumor, that you are to say his disciples stole his body. And they gave him a sum of money, and it was in exchange for their lives because uh, this would be a better idea than dying. Go out and tell a lie that the supposed resurrection did not happen. In fact, his disciples stole the body. And the scripture says that rumor or that story persists to this day among the Jews. And not just the Jews, by the way. It is a worldwide resurrection rumor. Now, why, with the evidence of the first-hand witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, did those spiritual leaders of the day reject the evidence of his resurrection? The answer is simple. It did not fit the narrative. It did not fit their agenda. They did not need a living Jesus. They pulled every string they had to kill him. They certainly didn't need him to be alive. So they advanced a rumor that we'll call the resurrection rumor. That persists to this day. And some people still rather accept the rumor resurrection than honestly and intellectually consider the preponderance of evidence for the resurrection. I'll be with uh, Lee Strobel, who was the 
a journalist in Chicago that set out to consider the evidence and thereby disprove the resurrection. And of course, you know what happened to him. On studying the evidence, he became a Christian. And his statement was is that the evidence for the resurrection is so compelling that it was the most logical, rational thing I could do. Follow Jesus. So, we have this evidence that gives us confidence in the truth, the reality of the resurrection, in spite of the rumors that still persist to this day. The evidence says this happened. My question for you, and this will be where we land tomorrow, and I'll stop here, is to those of you who probably, honestly, Peter, believed before you got here tonight. I hope that maybe Peter's speech tonight convinced some who were considering, honestly, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you've seen some evidence now. There's much more. Uh, make a decision now. It seems to be the most rational, most logical thing a person can do in view of the evidence, to follow Jesus. But some of you came in here and you're already convinced this will be my night before Easter question for you. You believe the evidence. You accept the fact and the reality of the resurrection. Here is the question. What difference does it make to you today that Jesus is alive? Is this for you just a doorway to salvation so that you can have heaven and eternal life? Or is the resurrection reality real in your life right now, today? For every Christian, everything we believe about the gospel and the word of God and the life of Jesus, every word he said, every command he issued, every expectation he communicated, hangs on the truth of this fact, Jesus is alive. That being true, every other word he said is true. Every command, every demand, he is right to ask of us. And we must, the logical, most rational response, follow Jesus. Dr. Williams, I'm thrilled to have you here. God bless you and thank you for being here. Great job tonight. Thank you for letting me have a few moments and for everything that you do to facilitate these things. It would be hard enough to face an audience like you, so erudite and so passionate about Scripture, but you compound that with having to follow one of the most prolific scholars of our generation who said pretty much everything that I could have said, but much better. And I found out in the midst of it that there's one language in the world he doesn't know. I mean, Chinese. So I'm relieved there's one language he doesn't know. <laughs> Thought he knew them all. But then, after that, to be followed by the senior pastor of this great church, then to have my few words and then to be cross-examined by a trial lawyer. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing up here, so... <laughs> I'll give you a few minutes. Mark knows that I'm chronologically challenged, so if it gets into 35 minutes, just kick me off the stage, no problem. Um, I will. I've got a, few, got a few responses, though, that I'd like to give. I took a few notes. I'd like to focus my comments on three things. Lenses, probabilities, and then Jesus as focus or focal lens of everything else. So let's start with lenses. Some people talk in scholarship about the synoptic problem, the problem that we have these different versions or these different sort of uh, ways of describing the events of the Gospels. Well, Julia Scott and some of my other teachers have mentioned in the past that we shouldn't talk of a synoptic problem, we should talk of a synoptic bonanza. And that's part of what you got this evening. Different lenses of viewing the same event. So we have not only the four lenses of the Gospels, but we have the lenses of the epistles in the New Testament. And let's add to that, we have the lenses of the Old Testament, which when you bring together the different comments that are made throughout Scripture about Jesus Christ, you get into very serious probabilities that there's something real going on here. Known, documented texts preceding Jesus by a thousand years, some of them seven, eight hundred years, and they are together converging so powerfully around this person of Jesus Christ. So lenses, different lenses through which we can view the Gospels and through which we can view the resurrection. Now if we expand this idea of lenses another way, you might think of it in terms of our own personal biographies. So if you asked me what my life history was, I might give you the example of where I grew up and where I've lived in my life. So that's the first question you ask somebody, right? Where are you from? Well, I might give the lens of my employment and my education. So I was educated here, or I worked there. Or you might ask me, what's, what are my family relationships? And I would start with my wife. So I might give you a whole narrative of the development of our relationship. And there would be different facts there 
But if you brought them all together, if they all converged together, they wouldn't contradict. They would just be simply different lenses on the same event. And I think the Gospels are kind of that way. I want to affirm what Professor Williams said, that we have different lenses that focus in on the same event and converge together. Well, the second point is the issue of probability. If the lenses all converge together into a powerful focal point, I think when we begin to look at probabilities, we get the same thing going on. And this is where the lawyers in our midst uh, come into play here. Um, when you start to look at mainstream scholarship, most of it is coming from the perspective of a hermeneutic of suspicion. And so that hermeneutic of suspicion is viewing the text as guilty until proven innocent. And anybody who thinks of the text as innocent until proven guilty is kind of out to lunch in the mainstream sort of scholarly viewpoint. What we've seen tonight is an example of the top-level scholarship coming at it with a hermeneutic of faith, yes, but with solid evidence that converges around probabilities. And those probabilities converge just like these lenses of interpretation converge around a focal point that when you get down to it reaches a critical mass that you just can't navigate around. You just can't dismiss it because your presuppositions somehow won't allow it. So the lenses converge in, I think, a powerful way, but so do these probabilities. So you triangulate these different events together, the Old Testament documentation, the circumstantial evidence you have here, and they come together around Jesus Christ and around the resurrection. In the end, that is a more believable narrative than the narrative that it didn't happen. In other words, the uphill battle, the burden of proof, if you were facing Mark Lanier in the courtroom, <laughs> you'd have a much greater burden of proof to disprove the resurrection, in my view, than you would have proving it. And N.T. Wright, again, has expressed some of these things, I think, very, very well. A critical mass is reached. Now, let's just look at those probabilities and those lenses through a little bit of a different viewpoint. Um, Philip Long has a wonderful book, The Art of Biblical History. And he speaks there about art in a way that can help us understand a little bit about the Gospels and even about the resurrection. What he says there is that we're looking, when we look at Scripture, at a portrait and not at a photograph. So let me give just an example. I have a caricature of myself in younger years with a big mustache and a full head of hair, if you can believe it, and I'm standing in front of, in front of Mount Ararat. I was driving my father's 1968 VW through eastern Turkey. And this friend of mine drew a caricature of me. And I think what he gets in my eyes and my manner and some of my expressions is much more true of who I really am than the photograph that people took of me the same week, the same day. So I think sometimes the artistically rendered caricature is truer to the person than the photograph. And what we have, in a sense, in looking at the resurrection is a photograph, yes, in a larger template, but a caricature that is bringing it to life in an even more powerful way. And I would argue that if the resurrection had been manufactured, we wouldn't be getting a caricature and we wouldn't be getting a photograph, but to take the analogy further, we'd be getting a doctored up Photoshop photograph <laughs> that would very conveniently bring everything together. It would bring together all the circumstantial evidence that Professor Williams has so brilliantly presented, but it would even give more, because that's what ancient texts tend to do. When they want to elevate somebody, they take away all the warts. They Photoshop the picture and make them much larger than life. Jesus Christ is larger than life and more believable without the Photoshop, with the larger circumstantial evidence and these different convergence points that we have. So lenses and probabilities, and then point three, Jesus Christ as focal point. Now we can look at the book of Jonah and his interaction with the book of Jonah. He lives right near to where Jonah grew up and speaks to Jonah. He speaks about things that... Um, occur in the life of Elijah. He's constantly referring to the biblical text. So there's a very powerful database from there if you think about it. But let's look at Jesus as focus in a slightly different way. First of all, if we set our broader hermeneutic, if we follow Colossians 1 and we follow John 1, then he's the creator of everything. So the same individual who is there at the beginning of the world and brings order from tohu vavohu, the chaos of the first things of creation, is the same individual sitting in the boat, calmly with no fear, who says to the disciples, oh, why is your faith so limited? Here, let's still the waters. This is the same God who is 
parting the waters of the Exodus, showing control over all creation. So once we put that into place, miracles themselves, in a sense, are not miracles because they are part of what we would expect to happen. A creator God and the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the author of all things, maneuvering the physics in the way that he sees fit, be it raising Lazarus or rising from the dead. Powerful. Let's look at a different way to see Jesus' focal point. Jesus is walking around Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, and he's going to many places that have been there for thousands of years. And this is no doubt as a Jew and as a, um, of course, as the divine son of God in his mind and in his database, but he's walking around and he's got Jeremiah in his mind all the time. Jeremiah suffered in the same little city of David. Jeremiah went up and preached temple sermons that have the same verbiage as some of Jesus' uh, responses to the naysayers. He's thinking about Jeremiah and his suffering and the false prophets and Babylon and Rome and all these things converging. But there's much more than that. He's walking up and down the city of David, named after his own great ancestor. He's meditating on the Psalms that are actually talking about David, his own ancestor. He walks across the Kidron Valley and he goes up to the Mount of Olives. And what might he be thinking? What did David do? He turned around on the Mount of Olives and wept over Jerusalem as he was abandoned by Absalom and went off to a different place and only came back later. He was betrayed by his own family. Jesus, wow, in a sense he's been there, done that through David himself. But it gets even more powerful than that. Let's go back to Abraham. Abraham comes to Jebus, the city of Jerusalem, and what does he do there? He goes and sees a priest, and what's the priest's name? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Let's go full circle and go to the book of Hebrews. What do we learn of Jesus Christ? He is a priest, not in the order of Aaron and Moses, but of whom? Wow, amazing. So you get a layered approach that comes to the focal point of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, raised from the dead. It's simply profound. And I could give you many, many examples of this, Jesus as focal point. So let me just end with, I think, um, maybe a fun one. Last night, some of us got together and, and um, enjoyed a uh, sort of a, a messianic Passover. Now, the Passover is, in a sense for the Jewish people, a celebration time because they are redeemed from bondage physically. But 49 days after Passover, there is a time of great anticipation that comes to fulfillment, and that's the Feast of Shavuot. And what is the Feast of Shavuot? The Feast of Shavuot is the time of the first fruits. And it's just as physical a feast as Passover. And what's very interesting about Shavuot is that's traditionally when the Torah was given at the first Shavuot, the Feast of Shavuot. So they've been redeemed physically, in the Exodus and Passover, and now they've been redeemed in a sense spiritually by the law of Moses, by the Torah. So how interesting it is that not only do we have the power of the resurrection, but we have the anticipation of these early Christians, who are also Jews, most of them, thinking like, okay, what comes next? Shavuot, Pentecost, Passover has been here, now it's gonna come, now it's gonna come. Jesus ascends to heaven and boom, Shavuot, they all gather together and the Holy Spirit falls on the day of greatest expectation. And there, in a sense, is a post-resurrection argument, I would say, for the resurrection itself. So I wanted to suggest, and simply to affirm Professor Williams' I think brilliant lecture, that the lenses that we have converge around Christ. When we speak of probabilities, we cannot speak in terms of discounting the resurrection, but affirming the resurrection on sheer probabilities. And then finally, Jesus brings all these things into focus. He is the pattern, as you suggested. He is the target, and he is the architecture for the whole thing. So thank you for that terrific lecture. It's great to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm going to quote a lawyer. A lot of people believe that the early church father, the father of the Latin church, Tertullian, who was writing in about 200 AD, was a lawyer before he became a theologian. Tertullian is the first gentleman uh, of the early church to use the word Trinity. He wrote in Latin. He was a Latin church father. But you place him at 200 AD in terms of what we've been listening to, 167 years or so after the resurrection. Tertullian said that the seed of the church was built upon the blood of the martyrs. Amen. 
And what I want to respond to from what Peter said is, one of the most compelling evidences to me of the resurrection is the fact that within 30 years of the death of Christ, at the time Tacitus is writing, well, not at the time he's writing, but the events of Nero in 64 AD, about which Tacitus is writing, that there were significant, quote, vast numbers of people who so believed the faith that they were willing to die for it. You have a church experiencing massive growth. The Gospels tell us that Jesus' ministry was vastly popular until he kept preaching this certain message and the crowds start dwindling and by the time he's at the cross, there are a handful. It's dwindled to a handful of people in a backwater country of the Roman Empire. And yet, within 30 years, it has expanded and proliferated everywhere in the known world. And it continued to grow at a significant rate, even while its adherents were being killed for their belief. And what Tertullian the lawyer was saying is that's compelling because more people put their faith in this as a result of people willing to give their life for this. My first comment. My second comment is Peter talked about the doubt that's in the Gospels. By the time you get to Acts chapter 2, there is no more doubt. Because by the time you get to Acts chapter 2, in Acts, something very significant happens at that next feast. The Holy Spirit descends upon the church. And for the first time, these folks actually understand what Jesus was talking about. And Peter's able to get up and give a profound sermon quoting Joel and other passages because of his understanding which is precisely what Jesus said would happen in John 14, 15, and 16. In John 16, Jesus says, and, and that whole passage starts out with uh, 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 the apostles clearly not understanding what Jesus is talking about. You read it. They clearly have no clue as he's talking to them right before his betrayal. But he says that the Spirit will come a helper that the Father will send, and he will convict the world. And they will then understand that Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Jesus, and the Father is in them, or Jesus is in them. That then they will understand fully what they needed to know to communicate the message. That the Holy Spirit would guide them in truth. And the doubt that was there in the Gospels is gone. My two comments, the lawyer. Now, questions. Could you please comment on the theory that Paul's beliefs on the resurrection of Jesus evolved throughout his epistles? I suppose I'd need to know what particular theory we're, we're thinking about. Um, certainly, it seems uh, that it's there right from the beginning. Uh, in terms of what goes on in Galatians. So uh, Galatians chapter 1, we'll talk about um, him having um, encountered uh, Jesus and got his message straight from Jesus. And it's got a 14-year period and a three-year period. Some people add those two to make 17 years. Some people uh, think the three is part of the 14. But that's going earlier than uh, Galatians. So it gets you a, a long way back. Uh, he tells his uh, testimony, uh, or the testimony of Paul is given thrice in the book of Acts, twice told by Paul. Um, so the idea that it, that it evolved, I mean, he believes he encountered uh, Jesus on the Damascus Road. One way people might try and do it is say, well, at first he believed in a spiritual resurrection and later it became more physical. Be careful. 
When he uses the word spiritual in uh, 1 Corinthians, he's not saying spiritual meaning so you can't touch it. He means spiritual in the sense of not um, part of the corrupted order. That's what he means. What weight do you give to the Shroud of Turin? I wouldn't give it any weight. Uh, I know Gary Habermas does in his arguments for the resurrection. But I like to focus on things that are um, part of the big narrative of early Christianity, not that sort of thing. How do you answer those who see the difference in accounts as indications that the scriptures are human and not divinely inspired, or at least not inerrant? Well, I believe that the um, uh, scriptures are human and divine, so I don't see any uh, problem there. On the question of their complete truthfulness or inerrancy, um, we need to get the burden of proof in, in the right place and someone needs to prove an error if they want to maintain an error and that means they need to show that there's no possible way that the accounts could fit together it's not I don't have to go around proposing one specific model for how two things fit together often there are multiple ways that they could fit together and the problem is we just don't know how is this some of the um, line of thought you were giving to the idea that there were six women as Dr. Monson said, different lenses, different angles, different ways of seeing things. Well, yeah, I think um, w what we can have is a, a greater group of events. Um, people see different things, different angles. Angels are allowed to move. Um, you know, uh, you can have one thing said by one angel and one from another. So what I'd need if someone wants to find what they see is a, an, an error is they need to come with a very specific question and... Uh, which will be the next be. one. Yeah, okay. I seem to recall a difference in the Gospels over the words written on the sign above Jesus while he was on the cross. Mm -hmm. And in fairness, they then added, I don't have a Bible next to me. I don't remember which accounts. Uh, if my question is false, then disregard this. Uh, we can try all four uh, accounts. Uh, so you, got, uh, you do have that wording uh, mentioned in all four Gospels. Of course, there are um, at least three languages, uh, uh, Roman, Greek, and let's say Hebrew or Aramaic, um, uh, involved. And I think you also have the fact that something can be a true record as well as an incomplete record. So it's not that everything that is true has to be maximally complete. Is there evidence other than the Bible of the soldiers being exonerated for not securing the body of Christ? No. The lunar eclipse on Friday in 33 AD is shown from 6 to 7, 11 p.m. The Bible has darkness from the third hour to the sixth hour. The Jewish day started at sunset. Wouldn't that move the time of darkness into the next day Passover? It all depends what would cause uh, darkness. Uh, so uh, there is this person, Thallus, who seems to put it down to eclipse. And uh, we don't know much about Thallus. Julius Africanus, who is a bright chap, um, uh, writing in the early third century says, well, that's not very reasonable because you can't get an eclipse at full moon. Um, so I think uh, what causes darknesses during daytime usually are things like dust storms. But I mean, you know, the, the, the point is uh, I don't have to have a particular model of explanation. Um, a, a, you know, one can appeal to something completely unparalleled and supernatural. One can appeal to something uh, natural. Uh, I am... Uh, entirely agnostic. I don't think there's any evidence that would lead us to a specific model. From a language perspective, would you say that the language requires a three-hour darkness, or would you say that that might be a time period within which the darkness was experienced? I think that when we're talking about hours, we've got to remember our hours don't quite equal their hours in the sense that they divide up daylight into 12 sections and they roughly equi uh, equivalent to our hours. In John's Gospel, he, um, you do get uses of hours other than on 3, 6, and 9. In the Synoptic Gospels, you only get the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and in the parable of workers, just at the last minute, the eleventh hour. But basically, because people did not have watches, you didn't look up and say, well, it's five o'clock or you know, the fifth hour, the sixth hour. You thought, hmm, sun's about there, it's the third hour, and the third hour is a whole section um, so I don't think it's a question of wanting to be massively precise about um, this third hour till the sixth hour is th a broad chronological range, which would be roughly equivalent to three hours of ours, but let's not think of it in um, uh, using the precision that we have today. Okay. What day was Jesus crucified on, and was he buried three days? Um, he was uh, crucified on a Friday, 
And obviously people are thinking about, you know, how can the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth uh, three days and three nights like Jonah, thinking of Matthew chapter 12. Um, there are different ways of, of dealing that with that. What I can say is the Gospels are very happy to alternate between the phrase after three days and on the third day, which for us are different periods. What's more, we can say that sometimes in a, a language, um, you can have a, a, a time expression which can't be quite analyzed. So does anyone know how to say two weeks in French? Okay, we've got uh, two weeks, literal translation. Another one, how might you say something happens two weeks later? Anyone? No? Anyone heard the phrase 15 days, 15 jours? Yeah? So they say 15 days. That's the way they do it. But actually, if you count back, it's only 14. Um, so there you, you can have phrases like that which are used. People count things differently. So certainly by our counting, it wasn't three days. Um, there are rabbinic sources that talk about a part of a day being counted as a whole day. Um, so th there are ways you could get three days and three nights out of it if you wanted to. I had heard Jesus was born in 3 or 4 BC. Is that right or wrong? Uh, well, it could be right. Um, <clears throat> the way people work out the, the birth of Jesus is that in Matthew's gospel, he is... Um, born before Herod the Great dies. In Josephus, we're told that there was a lunar eclipse um, just before Herod the Great died. Well, there are lunar eclipses in 6 BC, 5 BC, 4 BC, and 1 BC, and people have tended to choose the 4 BC date. And so Herod the Great was born in 4 BC, and therefore Jesus must have been born before that. There are some academic papers nowadays arguing that, Jesus, uh, that Herod actually died in 1 BC. The early church tended to date Jesus' birth as 3 or 2 BC. Um, there, a lot depends on what you do with Josephus' evidence. It's a complex issue if you want to get into it. Okay, did Mark write his gospel when he went home after Paul fired him? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what if he did it at home? I mean, uh, the tradition is that... Um, he wrote it in Rome. There is one tradition that says Alexandria. So by this stage, he would be uh, back in Paul's desired list. Here's a question by a nine-year-old. Well I would like done. to ask you how long you've been studying the resurrection and when you started believing in God. Um, I've been uh, studying the resurrection, uh, let's say, on and off for quite a while. I um, was brought up in a Christian family, came to faith around age 12. I'm 41 now. Uh, I started thinking about this lecture seriously six months ago. Um, so, uh, but I've been thinking about the subject on and off for longer. Um, but good to start when you're nine. With such a wonderful blessing and love for varying languages regarding God's word, how do you reconcile so many variant English-specific translations? King James, New King James, New American Standard, NIV. With the need for accuracy of information, <coughs> God intended for mankind and all nations to understand it. And in fairness, I should let you know, Peter is on the committee for translating the English Standard Version. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, well, what I'd say is the best, I think I gave this same answer last year, the best Bible translation to have is the one you read the most. Um, and uh, that I, I don't think uh, there's a problem with there being lots of translations. In, a fa in, in fact, the fact that you can go and travel in different countries and speak to Christians who speak different languages and find that they believe the same sort of things is because they're reading uh, the same uh, uh, Bible. So actually, the differences between all of the translations are not very great. There are, of course, some differences of style, some more literal, some more archaic, some more contemporary. Um, and you could say that you can have different translations for different purposes. I think it's good to have a translation that you can go deep with and really study the word closely. Is, in Matthew 28, 1, is the word for Sabbath singular or plural in the original language? You know what I'm getting at, dot, dot, dot. Um, so it's, the Greek is opse de sabbaton, so it's plural. Um, and uh, I take that to mean the uh, Sabbath, uh, you know, it, I take it to mean after the Sabbath. 
so I suppose the, the word, the first word is, is it after the Sabbath or late on the Sabbath? There is an early church tradition that reads Matthew's Gospel as talking about the late Saturday evening, uh, and I don't go with that. Um, what is the state of the church in England today? Uh, in God's care. <laughs> As it's the same as the church all over the world. Do currently published Talmuds include the reference in Sanhedrin 43a, or is it left out? Uh, we get it from the facsimile. Um, there is a facsimile available of the Munich Talmud, which has uh, that uh, text in. I think the Song Kino does not. Okay. Um, does the Greek word used in the Great Commission mean as you go? Poriuthentes, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little background to this question. Uh, uh, there's a group of scholars who think that Matthew and Luke wrote their Gospels off of Mark and some unknown gospel that they just call Q. So with that background, what's your view on the Q source relating to synoptic gospels? Well, one of the things about this idea is people can mean different things by Q. For some people, it's simply shorthand for anything which is common to Matthew and Luke, which isn't in Mark. For other people, it's something they really believe existed as a document, and some people, and I've met some of these, believe that they can isolate different stages of Q, and there was a Q community, and they can describe its geographical knowledge, and there are three different stages of Q, Q1, 2, and 3, and so on. Uh, and, you know, some people take that a bit far. I like to study documents that can actually be seen, rather than which are hypothetical. I'm not saying it didn't exist. I'm just saying... Um, I don't know whether it's very fruitful use of, of, of energy to think about it. So I try and make my apologetics uh, for the Gospels independent of whether you subscribe to that theory or not. M my point is just working with the text as it stands, there's internal evidence which could work on a number of different theories. Would you please tell, and, and not in a, he, he won't brag on himself, but I want you to understand the quality of scholar in the eyes of the world that you've had today. There is a, a palim set, which you can explain what is, mm -hmm. but Peter has recently been asked to do the, the, he's been in essence given a five year exclusive request and authorization to do the very first translation on this full palim set that dates to the 5th or 6th century, I believe. This is an amazing honor that will make Peter probably the world's greatest authority on Palestinian Christian Aramaic um, once he's done. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not now. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, Peter, would you just tell everybody what it is you're doing? Well, how many of you have heard of Hobby Lobby? Okay. okay. Well, um, the, 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 the family who own that have got involved in buying biblical manuscripts and they acquired one, in fact, from Cambridge a little while ago. And um, they are now um, partnering with people to get those published through something called the Green Scholars Initiative. And so uh, they're going to be um, allowing Tyndale House to work on this uh, manuscript. And it's one of those things that because of the shortage of writing material back then, people would get something that's already got writing on, scrub off the writing, and then write something else on top. We want to get the, at the writing they've scrubbed off. Okay, and to do that, we need some good images, because it's actually, this manuscript has got the greatest collection of Jesus' sayings in something similar to the dialect he would have spoken in Aramaic uh, that there is in the world. It's, it's a translation from the Greek. It's not more original than our Bibles, but it's something that's uh, still uh, useful. And so I'm going to try and work at that. I don't think I will become the world's leading scholar in five years. It might take it longer than that for this very narrow area. Uh, you know, the, the idea is that you know more and more about less and less until eventually you know everything about nothing. And that's <laughs> scholarship. <laughs> so with that, would you join me in thanking Peter again? Thank you, my friend.